Welcome, Dr. Epic here. And what we're going to discuss in this section is the sun, the moon, the stars, chocolate money, garden cities in the jungle, and epigraphic history, because this lecture is going to focus on classic Maya archaeology. The lecture is going to follow that outline right up above my head, and it's designed to give you all the information you need to answer that question there on the left. And that question reads, the classic Maya uh, maintained a sustainable settlement of the tropical rainforest for a thousand years. Then in the 8th and 9th century, this ecological balance unraveled, which led to the classic Maya collapse. So the question here is, what seems to have happened in that collapse? How did an environmental balance become so upset that the entire civilization failed uh, within two centuries? What happened to classic Maya civilization that turned it from what it is there on the upper left, this living, breathing, vibrant cultural tradition, to what it is today, which is right up above my head? The broken remains of about 20 city-states scattered across uh, the forest floor that consist only of an imperfect and partial archaeological record. Now, to answer this question, we're going to look at four traits of classic civilization, and especially how these traits factored in to the cultural ecology of the Maya. And the four traits are, uh, one, uh, advanced calendrics, two, an extensive and commercialized economy, three, an extensive low-density urbanism, and four, a fully literate script. And we're going to start with an advanced system of calendrics. The Maya calendar is, is deservedly quite famous. Uh, it is, in fact, the most accurate astronomical calendar ever invented by humans. Uh, and it does this because it's not dependent. It doesn't take, like, the solar year as the center uh, of, of the calendar, like the Gregorian calendar, like our calendar does. Because when we put the solar year at the center of our calendar, we make it the most important part of our calendar. That factors in a lot of errors. Uh, because we have to deal with things like leap days and leap years, and even in some cases, leap minutes and leap seconds. So we're constantly fiddling with our calendar because the orbit of the Earth doesn't exactly divide into um, a, a rotation around the sun. At any rate, the Maya didn't have to worry about any of that because their calendars were based on simple day counts. And the Maya calendar actually consists of two interlocking calendars. The calendar round, which is there on the left, and the long count, which is directly over my head. And I'm, I'm just very briefly going to describe how these things work. They're going to sound like really, really complicated, but they're actually not that complicated. They're not any more complicated than our, than our system of, of days, weeks, uh, months, and years. And basically the way that these two calendar systems worked is uh, the calendar round, that's the system on the left. The calendar round consisted of itself, it had two internal parts. The Zlokin, which was a day count, and then the hob, which was kind of like a month count. And the way it worked was that you had uh, sequential counts attached to day signs for each of the Zlokin and the hob. And for the Zlokin, you have sequential numbers that go from 1 to 13, but then you have 20 day signs, uh, which rotate independently. That way, every time you get to 13 and go to 1, it's at a, it's at a different day sign. And the hob works sequentially. You have... This, this, the count of these hob months, and there's uh, 18 of these with 20 days each, with the, with the last hob only having five days to sort of make up the end of the year. And the way it basically worked was like this. You have a day. Let's just start with a day. Uh, this day will be called Four How Eight Kumku. And I, fixed, I picked that day because in Maya cosmology, that's the day of creation. That's the day that the world was created. So you have Four How Eight Kumku. The next day, you're going to have an advance of each of the numbers, a change of the day sign, uh, but the hob sign will stay the same. So the, the first day of creation was four how eight kumku, but the second day of creation was five imish nine kumku. All right? So, and, and that's how it's going to go. And basically, uh, it, it, it follows this cycle, and everything is slightly out of step so that you never have a repetition of the same numbers, the same Zlokin signs, or the same hob signs. Uh, this whole cycle only repeats itself after, I think, every uh, 52 hob cycles, which is basically after 52 years is, is when the cycle starts, when the calendar round starts to repeat itself. So basically, when you have a combination of numbers and signs, that numbers and signs will probably only repeat itself like once, in, once or maybe twice in your life. 
if you come across a day that's for a how eight kumku, you probably won't experience that same combination again for 52 years. You might not even be alive by then. At any rate, uh, the this calendar round does nicely fit into basically about a human generation. So that's the calendar round. But in addition to the calendar round, they have something called the long count. And the long count is basically a record of days from the first day, which was for a how eight kumku. And the way that the long count works is that basically you have uh, different cycles of different amounts, which all add up. You have a single day, which is called a keen. A unit of 20 days, 20 keens, uh, is called a winal. And then you have 18 winals fits together into a single tun, which is 360 days, roughly a solar year. And then when you have uh, 20 tuns, that fits together into a single katun. So basically a katun is, is roughly equivalent to about 20 years. And then you've got the largest sort of operative unit within the long count, the bak tun, which is 20 katuns. So it's 20 times 20, 400 years. Of course, far too large, far too large a unit to be experienced uh, within, any, within any human time frame. So basically, each of these units was given a count from the dawn of creation. You would have the ninth baktun, the tenth katun, the ninth tun, the seventh winal, and the twelfth keen. That would like that. That's for instance is a is a long count number. Uh, and basically, from the long count, from the first day of creation, as the Maya conceived it, there have been thirteen baktuns. Where we are currently in the thirteenth. And they would celebrate these things called period endings, which is when all of the numbers would line up to be zero, when there would be a turning of a new katun, or most importantly, the turning of a new baktun. And between these two calendar systems, they produced highly, highly accurate calendars. They could really tell exactly what part of the year they're in and exactly what the date is going to be in 20 days or in 20 months or in 20 years. They knew exactly where they were at any point in the calendar, and as we'll see, could check their own calculations against the stellar map, against the stars in the sky. Uh, in fact, I once read a, like a science fiction story with like time travelers and stuff, people traveling through time. And one of the things I, th I thought was really cute about this science fiction story, the story about the time travelers, uh, was that they decided they couldn't use the Gregorian calendar because it was too inaccurate. So the time travelers were using the classic Maya calendar to travel to all these different periods in time, which if you're going to travel through time, you're, you, would, you would have to use the Maya calendar. It's just more accurate. To aid in their calendar, they had this highly complex system of mathematics, like a really complex system of mathematics. Uh, in fact, they independently invented the zero and used it in positional notation, which is something only a single other civilization in the world ever did, which was the civilizations in South India, which is, you know, in Asia. And if you look right up above my head, this is how the Maya numeracy system worked. Uh, you had sort of a shell, that is a zero. And then you have a one, which is a dot, and then the dots are added up horizontally. So two dots is two, three dots is three, four dots is four. But when you get to a multiple of five, it's just a single bar. So to express like six, it would be a single horizontal bar and then one dot right over the top. That's how you would write six. And it does this all the way up to 19. So to write 19, it would be uh, three horizontal bars and then four dots on top. But when you reached 20, that's when you start using a positional notation. To express 20, you just put a shell, which is a zero, and then a dot right on top, which indicates a complete cycle has been finished. So to write 20, you just write a shell and a dot. You know, and that's how the system of positional notation worked. And you can look right up above me and see how the position of how this system works. This is a really advanced numerical system. In fact, it is far, far more advanced than anything they were using in, in the classic Mediterranean. Like Roman numerals, for instance, like don't possess the zero. Uh, and, you know, you can add and subtract Roman numerals. But when you start getting into really large sums like Roman numerals get incredibly complicated, which is why we don't use Roman numerals anymore. But the Maya system works. You can add and subtract extremely large numbers quite easily. And in fact, you can add and subtract, you can even multiply and divide pretty significant sums without a lot of problem. 
the positional notation, the Maya numeracy system works. It, you can handle these enormous sums quite easily. And what they would do is use this numeracy system in combination with their calendrical system and create these very elaborate stellar almanacs. And that's what you have there on the left. I believe this is a page uh, from uh, the Venus Almanac from one of these few remaining Maya books, a book called the Dresden Codex. And what this book is, as you can see, it's this group of numbers and units. It is a record of the cycles of Venus, the morning star, as it appears in various parts of the sky throughout the year. And these Maya almanacs are, in fact, incredibly accurate. And if you, if you read Maya and you can work out the number system, you can sit down with these ancient Native American books and you can still use them. You can look, at, look up these sums in the almanac and say, oh, in five days, uh, Venus will be in this part of the sky. And they work. They are highly, highly accurate because the uh, Maya were the ancient sky, the sky watchers of ancient Mexico. And they checked their calendrical system against the movement of cosmic bodies in the sky. And they did this through the use of observatories. If you see that structure there on the left, that's a building called the Caracol. And it's from the, the ancient city state of Chichen Itza. And standing in the Caracol, you have these slots carved in the ceiling in each of the slots indicates a certain part of the sky where a certain star will appear at a certain date. Each, each position, each slot occurs when the moon will occur on a certain date, when the sun will occur during the solstice, during an equinox, um, or uh, during the winter solstice. They have these observatories. And they also had architectural observatories in these things called e-groups. And if you look right up above me, I mean, it's in Spanish, but it's still a really good drawing. It's a fantastic drawing, actually. If you look at this figure right up above me, that is an e-group. And what an e-group is, is a type of a, a astronomical calendar. Standing uh, on a central pyramid, the sun is going to come up at different parts over, over different structures uh, that are placed to the east. So you have the summer solstice, the winter solstice, the equinoxes. They are all coming up. In other words, not only did the Maya have this incredibly accurate calendar and know where they were at any point in the year and could predict what was going to happen, maybe in terms of weather, uh, in the succeeding months, in the succeeding Hob and Zoclean, they could actually check their calendar against the calendar of the night sky. And they had names for all of these constellations and would record when different constellations moved in and out of focus. Uh, for instance, this is a great photograph that somebody took. And this is the constellation of Ak Ek carrying uh, Osh Ib Shuk Ub, which is the heartstone of the cosmos. And one of the things about these, these Maya pyramids is almost all of these pyramids extend above the level of the trees. And one of the really interesting things about these Maya pyramids is you can, you know, like I have done, go to the top of one of these pyramids at night and you're actually above the tree line. You're above the level of the forest. And what you have is this unimpeded vista from horizon to horizon. And all of the stars, especially on a clear night, all of the stars of the sky just pop out. It is like the most incredible planetarium show you've ever seen. You can see the stars, you can see the Milky Way, you can see all of these constellations, you can see Ak Ek, if you know what Ak Ek is, and you can see uh, Oshib Shuk Ub, and you can see how these constellations are moving. It is just absolutely incredible. The Maya possessed this incredible numeracy system. They possessed the most accurate astronomical calendar ever invented, and they didn't do this just because. I mean, this is, you know, an artifact of their genius, but there is a functional aspect to all of this calculation, to all of this sky watching. And I want you to cogitate on this for a second. Think about it. And I want you to write that question down in your notes. Why would such a system of calendrics and mathematics be advantageous in a rainforest, especially in terms of agriculture. And I want you to think about this, think of an answer, and put that answer in your notes, because I am not going to give you that answer. 
although I'll probably ask you that question. Two, classic Maya civilization possessed an extensive and commercialized economy. Uh, and we absolutely know this for reasons we'll get into. And what this economy consisted of is these huge trade routes snaking across the whole of the classic Maya world, all three of the lands of the classic Maya, the highlands, the southern lowlands, and the northern lowlands. And these trade routes have been painstakingly reconstructed by archaeologists over the past few decades. And they're the sort of red lines that you see uh, on the map there on the left. So you have these trade routes connecting all of these city-states together. And you have all of these goods being moved uh, by canoe along the coast, uh, by canoes uh, up and down river systems, or uh, when these routes are overland, by human porters. The classic Maya didn't have any beasts of burden. They didn't have any ox or horses or anything like that. So if material moved over land, it had to move strapped to somebody's back. So we know that we have these big porter trails snaking across the Maya lowlands. In fact, there's one really famous one called the Great Western Road that extended, and in fact, it's, it's on that map. It extends from the highlands to Canquen, through Dos Pilas, uh, up to uh, El Peru Huaca and Motul de San Jose, and then finally north uh, to Calakmul, and all points north from there. And that was like a really important trade route. In fact, it's the back of something we'll talk about in just a tick called um, the Calakmul hegemony. And we absolutely know that the Maya possessed a commercialized economy. Uh, a few years ago, they uncovered a series of murals at the Cheek Knob complex at the city-state called Kalak Mul. And this is what those Cheek Knob murals look like. And you can see it is very clearly people in the act of buying and selling. Right up above me, there's a woman selling materials, placing these sold materials on top of someone's head. Uh, up there on the left, there's someone who is purchasing a welcome repast. And the woman that is uh, selling him that repast has kind of this big broad hat that is generally called the merchant's hat because it's also worn by the god of merchants, this guy called God L. And it's designed so you can sit there in the sun and, and it keeps the sun off you. And if you look on the left, there are another pair of vendors with big baskets full of goods measuring out materials and selling them. So we absolutely know that quite large markets existed in the classic Maya world. And I want you to compare these mural images to actual photographs of modern day uh, Maya markets. And you can see that the similarity is incredibly striking. We have the vendors kneeling on one side of large baskets filled with goods. They are, I mean, you can look there on the left. She is literally measuring out material and selling it to people in front of them. Uh, and this is another really interesting thing about these classic Maya markets, or modern day Maya markets for that matter. Almost all of the commercial activity is, is done by women. Um, Maya society is a highly gendered society and the buying and selling of things is almost entirely feminine. It's viewed as a very feminine thing, sort of buying and selling. It's very different from our culture. And to aid in this commercialized economy, there was currency, you know, that we've already discussed chocolate money. Cacao beans functioned as currency. They functioned as currency when the Spanish show up in the 16th century. And this uh, probably has a very, very deep antiquity. In fact, amounts of currency, amounts of cacao beans appear in the epigraphic record, probably being used as either tributes or gifts. So aiding in all of this buying and selling in these marketplaces and from marketplace to marketplace to marketplace across the classic Maya world, you have money, you have chocolate money cacao beans functioning as currency. Now, they probably had multiple currencies as well. Uh, and in fact, it is an artifact of modern society that we tend to think of currency as, as singular. There can only be one kind of money. But if you look back in, at classical civilization uh, in the Mediterranean or, or, or you know, uh, pre-industrial uh, civilization in China or India, one of the things you discover quite rapidly is that like multiple currencies can exist simultaneously. It certainly did in Africa as well. That um, And in what, what we have in the classic Maya world is, this is our probably our main currency, cacao beans, but we have a lot of other currencies operating simultaneously. Probably little red shells, probably jade beads, and probably an arm length of cotton cloth, something called a manta. So we have markets, we have trade routes, we have currency, and uh, an indicator of how extensive and the scale of this can lie in the ceramic footprint of this commercialized economy. 
in which we have these large patterns of very similar ceramics, something called ceramic spheres. And these were noted back in like the 1960s and 70s. And what I have argued in recent publications is that these ceramic spheres, these patterns of where all these sites possess similar ceramics, uh, that these ceramic spheres are basically indicators of the degree and extent of the commercialized Maya economy. And as you can see there, uh, the map on the left, each of those black dots is a great, is the remains of a classic Maya city-state. And the circles around those dots are the size of ethnographically known marketplaces. And if you map those on a, on a map, you can quite clearly see that all of these markets from all of these different city-states would have greatly overlapped. And the period of greatest overlap correlates almost exactly to the shaded area on that map, which is these patterns of known ceramic similarities, these ceramic spheres. And if we map the known trade routes, uh, and this is the other map that, that's immediately uh, uh, to right there uh, in blue. And if we map those known trade routes on top of the ceramic spheres, we can again see that the highest degree of trade and commerce also overlaps with these ceramic spheres. Uh, the ceramic spheres extend across sites with similar, if not identical, patterns of ceramic styles and technologies. This indicates widespread exchange of pottery across a wide area. And the classic ceramic spheres are the uh, archaeological footprint of this advanced, commercialized Maya economy. And I'll show you what some of these ceramics look like. If you look at that, that jar up there on the left, that's a jar of a type called uh, Tanaha Red. And basically, jars identical to that are found all across the area marked in blue on that map. Oh, there it is. Uh, that if you look at the blue areas of the map above me, almost all of them possess identical Tanaha Red jars. These jars are probably moving around from marketplace to marketplace to marketplace, from city to city to city, moving goods from one side of the Maya world uh, to the other. And we have exact... Uh, ceramics that tell us the extent of how much these ceramics are actually moving. Uh, if you look there on the far left, that's a little tobacco flask uh, in my hand. And that tobacco flask is a type called Don Gordon model carved. And uh, these types have been chemically sourced to the city state of Copan, which is there. And that tobacco flask was actually found in the tomb of Lady Cabell at the site of El Peru Huaca, which is located there, okay? And that's a distance of, of like 500 kilometers. It's, it's a really big distance. That shows how far some of these ceramics are moving around the Maya region. And if you look at that battered little polychrome vase right there, uh, that's a fragment of, you know, a potter, a piece of pottery that was probably produced in the Sierra La Condone area, probably around the city-state of Piedras Negras. Yet again, I identified that piece of ceramic at El Peru Huaca. So we absolutely know that ceramics are circulating in this economic system. Now, time to think. Why would a highly commercialized economic system that is capable of moving goods, services, ceramics, and almost certainly foodstuffs from one side of the Maya region to the other. Why would such a dispersed economic system be advantageous in a rainforest biome? Why would the ability to move food from areas of abundance to areas of scarcity where it could be sold at a profit be an integral part of the Maya agricultural system, an integral part of the cultural ecology of classic civilization? Now. Moving on to point three, these extensive low density uh, garden cities, low density urbanism. And we've already touched on this a little bit, but basically the Maya didn't have cities like we do today. They don't have cities like medieval Europe, where you have a highly nucleated city and then around the city you've got your, your farm fields and then way distant from that you've got kind of wild forest. Maya cities probably looked like the image right up above. Now, the artist basically just drew in trees where he didn't know structures were, uh, but he's probably actually quite accurate because in Maya cities, all of this was mixed together. You had population centers and residences mixed in among cornfields, in and among fallow fields, in and among the forests and swamps and rivers. Garden, these, these Maya cities were garden cities. They were completely mixed together, scrambled, if it were, with 
the, the materials of the rainforest with, with cornfields cut out of the forest and forest nearby acting as forest preserves, acting as hunting preserves, with everything mixed together. And this was extensive. These Maya cities were spread out over vast areas with all of these different habitations mixed together. And in addition uh, to just having this sort of mixed mosaic of field and forest and city, they again highly engineered the landscapes. Uh, and as you can see from these images on the upper left, this is of course uh, from Tikal. And what they did at Tikal is reshaped their entire epicenter and they hydraulically engineered drains and plazas and built these huge reservoirs so that during periods of intense rain, all of the rain would be funneled into these huge wading reservoirs, which would then be covered in, uh, they would allow uh, water lilies to grow on the top. Therefore, the water wouldn't evaporate in the heat of the sun. And there's a three-dimensional three rendering of this hydraulic engineering there on the lower left. And I want you to imagine how this three-dimensional model would work under torrential rain. All of the rain would fall onto the city, it would fall onto the pyramids, onto the structures, onto these huge open plazas, and then run down these specific canals and fill up these massive artificial lakes, these reservoirs. Think about this for a second. Why would the Maya be interested in huge water storage systems? Huge water storage system to store water when, it was, when there was too much of it maybe to use that water when there wasn't enough of it. And it's not just hydraulic engineering systems that they're, they're changing the terrain on a large scale. If you look right up above my head, all those black little lines, those are terraced farm, those are terraced cornfields. What they did is took this, these uneven hilly areas and instead of having just smooth slopes, they just cut notches out of these hills. They cut notches onto the side of these steep hills and proceeded to grow corn. And again, imagine this area, imagine a series of terraced fields during torrential rain. Instead of the rain uh, just going down the side of a smooth hill, it's gonna fill up each of these steps before pouring onto the step below it. They are turning large sections of difficult to handle terrain into arable land. They are dramatically reshaping uh, the rainforest landscape. And again, Think about this. Think about these garden cities. Think, look at those two cities on the left. This mix of forest, field, and residence. This mix of temples, plazas, and hydraulically engineered reservoirs. Think about these garden cities. Cogitate. Write this answer in your notes. Write this question in your notes. Why would such a dispersed urban pattern be advantageous in a rainforest biome, especially in terms of Maya agriculture. Okay, write that answer down because we're gonna move on to our fourth point, the, the epigraphic record. The classic Maya possessed the only known fully literate uh, Native American script. And altogether, this indigenous history is known as the epigraphic record. Now, to the Maya, historical time was seen as something that was cyclical. Hence, it was very important to write down history because when you write down history, because the past is the, is the future that hasn't happened yet, when you inscribe history, you are actually inscribing prophecy, that the recording of history is itself a type of prophecy, which is why the Maya are so keen on history, all right? And it's why they record down the events of their day, the events of their rulers. And a lot of, these, a lot of this monumental history is dedicated to the glorification of rulers. And it looks like the Stella you see right up above me. That's, of course, the, the Queen of El Peru Waka, uh, Lady Pakal. And if you look uh, uh, right there on the lower left, that is her magic dwarf, her attendant magic dwarf hanging. How cool is that? Oh, that would be cool to have a magic dwarf as your attendant. Yeah, magic. Well, she was a sorcerer queen. So yeah, there is that. Anyway, uh, the Maya possessed the only known fully literate Native American script. Uh, yeah, with the exception of the Aztecs may or may not have had one. Uh, a lot of epigraphers say that the Aztecs, a lot of linguists say that the Aztecs did have a fully literate uh, script, but I'm skeptical, but then again, I'm, I'm probably wrong. Uh, at any rate, the Maya epigraphic record generally focuses on three things. 
uh, one, which is the passage of time, as measured by that highly accurate astronomical calendar, especially as they note the passage endings of the long count, when there is a turnover of tuns, katuns, and maybe even baktuns, and they hold these big celebrations and mark these passage endings in their historical record. And this might seem a little strange that they're just kind of celebrating the, the end of time, uh, except that we need to remember that we do the exact same thing every New Year's Eve. The second thing that the epigraphic record tends to focus on is royal genealogy, especially as it relates to the glorification of the current king and especially the glorification of the, of the current ruler in the context of their royal genealogy as it relates to these royal bloodlines. And we'll talk about, well, I'll give you a specific example of that when we get to Tikal Stella 31, which is, which is that monument there on the left. And the third thing that the Maya epigraphic record tends to focus on are, are mythic or historical events, stories from the Popol Vuh, stories of the hero twins, stories of the creation of the world. And you tend to see more of these on ceramic vessels and on the ceramic corpus rather than on the big monumental histories. Uh, but it does occur all the time. In fact, I've, I've shown you a lot of the art featuring these, these mythic adventures of the hero twins and these, these, these sort of mythic adventures of gods and heroes. Now, I'm going to give you a specific example of this, uh, and that's what you see with the illustration there on the left. That is, an, that is a drawing, a line drawing, of a monument from the city-state of Tikal. You know, it's Stella 31. And basically, uh, it's a drawing of both the front of the Stella, which is this big carved stone, and as well as the sides of the Stella as well. And what it features is that a central figure is standing there in the middle. And he's so basically encrusted with royal and ritual paraphernalia that it's sometimes that some students have problems like making out exactly how he is. But I'm going to try to pose in the same position. That basically he's standing um, with his side towards the viewer. And he's holding um, his left hand like this. And then his right hand, he's holding up like this. And what he's holding in his right hand uh, is the crown of his father. And you can see that he's holding the crown of his father with long tassels. With the, that's the looped part of the sculpture. These long tassels coming off of that crown. And in his left hand, he's holding either a sacred staff or a sacred bundle. Uh, and that the, the, the epigraphic record of Stella 31 actually gives his name. Uh, and he is the 11th ruler of Tikal, and his name is Siachan Kawil. And that, race, that roughly translates into Skyborn Kawil Great Claw. These, these guys were very dramatic. These classic Mike kings were very dramatic. And anyway, uh, Siachan Kawil ruled the city-state of Tikal uh, from 411 uh, to 456. And what this is an image of, this is a celebration of Sia Chan Kuil's ascension uh, to the throne of Tikal. And he's holding the crown of his father. He's holding the sacred bundle of rulership. But he has two figures on either side of the Stella. And those are actually images of his deceased father. And his father's name was Yash Nun Ayin I. And his father is dressed as a warrior from the distant city-state of Teotihuacan, which was this like massive city in the middle of central Mexico. And everything about, he's basically wearing this sort of uniform of this foreign warrior. He's got, you know, the goggle eyes, the addle addle, the snake scale helmet, and the curtain shield. So literally, uh, this is exactly what I was talking about. It is the glorification of the current ruler in the context of his royal bloodline his ascension being overseen by the beneficial spirit of his deceased father. Um, so it's the, glorif it's the glorification of rulers. It's the glor glorification of classic kingship. Uh, now this is what the uh, monument looks like in real life. It's this huge standing stone. There's see a chancawil carved on the front of the stone. And on the sides of the stone, that's where the, the two images of the ghost of his father are. And that is, that's the example of what the, the Maya are doing with all of this epigraphic history. And here's what these monuments look like. I mean, they're just absolutely incredible. Uh, this absolutely incredibly fully literate Native American script. Now, the Spanish uh, encountered this in the 16th century and ruthlessly stamped out any knowledge of how to read the Maya glyphs. And they were, they were successful in doing so. And for centuries, uh, the ability to read the Maya glyphs was completely lost. 
and one of the great projects of the 20th century was the reconstruction of the ability to read these glyphs. And it was, an, it was an, a scholarly effort that met a great deal of resistance. Uh, some scholars in the mid 20th century actually argued that this wasn't a script at all, that this is not written history. These are just kind of like, I, these are just kind of idealized pictographs and it's just people pretending to write. And I mean, it seems so odd to me because it, you look at it and it's the, the, the preciseness and the detail and the intricacy of it. I mean, it's so clearly written, a written script, uh, but people couldn't read it for centuries. People couldn't read it. And it wasn't until scholars in the ninth, starting in the 1970s, really started to really make major breakthroughs as to how to read the Maya script. And if you're interested in the story of how the how the Maya code was itself broken, probably the best uh, bo uh, the best book written on the subject is there on the left, Michael Coe's Breaking the Maya Code. And he tells the story of like people piecing together emblem glyphs and people piecing together the number system and that they the Maya did in fact use positional notation. And, you know, renegade Soviet scientists and, and a child genius. There's bloody David Stewart right there. He's, he's like, I think he's probably like 16 in that image. This child genius piecing together the Maya Code together with Linda Sheely there on the left. And you can actually, today, uh, you can actually study the breaking of the Maya code. You can actually study how the Maya glyphs themselves are meant to be read. Because uh, the big breakthroughs came through in the 70s and 80s. And into the 90s, the dam was completely broken. Uh, and you can actually take classes about how to read the Maya glyphs. I took one of those classes. I mean, I'm not very good at it. And I can only piece out a handful of small glyphs, but I can do it. And if I really like dedicated myself, if I really put focused on it, you know, and spent a few years on the subject, I, I think I could get pretty good at it. There's a lot of really nice books on the subject. There's uh, John Montgomery's Dictionary of Maya Hieroglyphs. There's Michael Coe and uh, Mark Van Stone's Reading the Maya Glyphs, which is kind of meant to be a companion piece to Breaking the Maya Code. And if you really want to, uh, you can, you know, take classes, you can learn Maya hieroglyphs, you can go to Guatemala, you can stand in the center of Tikal in front of, you know, Stella 31, you can look at the glyphs, and you can just stand there and read them. It's absolutely incredible. This, the, the breaking of the Maya code is a major, major scholarly accomplishment. And probably what I think is the most wonderful thing about when scholars cracked the Maya code is what they proceeded to do next with it which is that they took this knowledge of how to read the Maya glyphs back to the Maya people themselves. And one of the things that Linda Sheely, uh, that's her on the left, did is to set up schools in Guatemala teaching the modern Maya people how to write in their ancient script. And today we have literally, you know, and this is just one of the most absolutely wonderful things that scholarship can do, the reintroduction of ancient knowledge to modern people. So we have today Maya scholars speaking and writing in their own indigenous script, which was recovered by the painstaking efforts of these, these uh, several generations of scholars in the 20th century. Now, what do these glyphs actually say? If you study the Maya hieroglyphs, what they do is reveal this very complex political landscape. And they reveal this system of alliances and treaties and marriages and descent systems between all of these different Maya city-states. And we can actually read the names of some of these Maya city-states. They're contained in these glyphs that you see right up above me. Those are emblem glyphs. Those are the names of ancient cities. There's Yashmutul, the ancient city of Tikal. There's Khan, the ancient city of Kalakmul. Uh, right there, there's the place I work at. El Peru Waka, which is the ancient city of Waka, which translates as the city of the centipede. Very dramatic. And uh, scholars have pieced together this political history, or at least parts of this fragmentary political history, and they've built that chart there on the left. And what it reveals is this highly complex history of these different city-states interacting with one another, a system of shifting alliances and enmities and hegemonies. And it resembles, you know, it really strongly resembles classical Greece with its mix of unequal city-states locked in histories of alliance and enmity and warfare and marriage and treaty. 
And each city was positioned between in, in, inside this web of political history, inside this web of political competition. You have this you have treaties, marriages, enmities, and alliances with this historical past that pretty much everyone knew. I mean, people knew where their kings were from. They knew where their rulers come from. They knew that their king's mother came from a distant city-state, and yet the king himself had to marry two women, uh, a one woman from our kingdom, but a neighboring woman from a much, a neighboring woman uh, from a much more powerful kingdom. And that princesses, that queen's children will be the next generation of rulers, because that's the way power politics worked. Now, a, um, a, a comprehensive political history of the classic Maya city-states has never been written. And one of the reasons uh, that this political history has never been written is probably because, you know, we're recovering new monuments all the time. And, and you know, I can tell you personally, like nothing is more incredible than literally digging up a monument covered with covered with hieroglyphs, however you know fragmentary they might be. I mean, that's there's a real thrill to that. So one of the problems is that you know if someone actually sat down to write you know the complete political history of the classic Maya, yeah, I mean they'd probably have to revise the book constantly, and it would it would be obsolete ten minutes after it was published. But the best effort to date is the book that's right above my uh, little yellow box. Uh, Simon Martin and Nikolai Grube's Chronicle of Maya Kings and Queens. It tells this sort of partial political history for about 10 of these classic Maya city-states. And it's really quite incredibly good. And the stories and the histories that come out of uh, the epigraphic record of this political web are incredibly interesting. And in fact, they probably hold the key to the classic Maya collapse. And that's what we're going to talk about next time, is how this incredible civilization falls apart and how that collapse is partially documented in the epigraphic record. And I will see you there.